Because I really feel impressed by the Holy Spirit to bring a message that I've never brought in my life. And so I've had to really dig in and, and put some time into preparing this to make sure that I'm theologically correct and doctrinally correct. And it's a subject that most don't want to go there. And you probably think, well, why are you talking about that to us? But I think by the end of it, you'll understand. And I know that the Holy Spirit wanted this message for someone. I don't know who it is. It might be more than one person. It might be all of us. I think all of us will get something out of it. Um, but it, it's what I would call a hard message. And I titled it Saved or Deceived. <laughs> and you think, well, we all know about salvation. Well, I think we all think we do. And I, that's why I question the Holy Spirit. Is this really what you want me to share? But this is what he's given me, so I'm going to bring it. Saved or deceived. And I think the reason he's got me bringing it is because you are going to encounter this very issue in the days ahead. There are a lot of people within Christendom, within the church, that believe they're saved. And they are not saved. It's that simple. And... Uh, if we're not ready for it and scripturally correct on this matter, we're not going to be able to answer this. And this is the biggest issue in the last days. My heart is very much for those who believe they're saved. And I say believe they're saved because a lot of people who believe they're saved aren't saved. And uh, that's where my heart lays today. And I, I guess this message has come out of years and years and years of struggling in my Christian walk until four and a half years ago where the Lord arrested me. And I question now whether I truly was saved. I really do. That's how much of an impact four and a half years ago had on me. Now only God knows that in everyone's life, but there are some scriptural references we can go to on this. Um, so, I'd like you to open your Bibles, first of all, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. And uh, it's just one verse there, and then we'll move forward from that. 1 John chapter 4, that's the epistle of John. Chapter 4, verse 1. Verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets, or that word can be interpreted teachers, have gone out into this world. It's these false teachers, false prophets, that are going to pave the way for the Antichrist in the last days. Um, so this word test that John uses here, <coughs> test the spirits, spirits meaning a person, so test the person. Because you are a spirit, I am a spirit. What he's saying here is test the person. Or it could be an angel. So an angel comes to you and says something. We need to test. Don't just accept that's from God. Because there's a lot of nonsense going on in the church today with visitations from angels that have nothing to do with God at all. The Bible says Satan comes as an angel of light. So we need to test the spirit, test the angel. That word test is the Greek word dokimazo, which um, it actually means it's a term that is used when metal is purified, dokimazo. And so he's saying, make sure that that person is pure. That's what he's saying. Make sure that that person or that angel is pure. And... Um, it's of no surprise that Satan operates through people both in the church and outside of the church. His primary work is within the church, not outside. Satan's primary focus is on the church. He's already got those outside of the church captured. It's, his primary focus is within the church, within the religious system of the world today. So that's Christianity, Judaism... Any other religion outside of that, he's already got anyway. So it's not an issue. It's not an issue to him. He's not working on that. He's already got them. He's working on the Christians, on the Jews that are searching for the Messiah. That's where he's working. So 
Romans 12, verse 28, Paul refers to the Jews as the enemies of the gospel. I only saw that yesterday. Yeah, you read your Bible for years. Paul said that the Jews were the enemy of the gospel. That's Romans 12, 28. And there are only two categories of people in this world. Those who are against the gospel and those that are for it. It's that simple. So if he can't keep us from believing in a saviour, Jesus, he will corrupt the teaching of the saviour. Romans 12, 28? Romans 12, 28. Romans 11, 28. Roman 11, sorry, I've given you the wrong If he can't stop you from believing in Christ, he's going to attack the message of Christ and corrupt it. And this is a major issue in the end days church because it talks about the great falling away, the apostasy, the falling away from the true church, which comes because of many false teachers and many false prophets. And um, we need to be aware of that. So drawing people into a false understanding of God's word called by the Apostle Paul as another gospel. That's what he called another gospel. When people are drawn into a message that is not the true gospel. So bad teaching disguises good teaching. We know all about that. The deception being the one listening believes what he's hearing is true. That's dangerous. And, and, and I'm bringing this because from someone in New Zealand this week called me on, a, on an issue to do with doctrine and, and issues in a church and someone from Australia called me the same thing so I know this is bang on what the Holy Spirit wants today and the call of the Berean is not taken serious enough in the church I believe that is the greatest problem to heresy in the church the, the lack of the call of the Berean which is um, most of the Christian community, and I use that word Christian loosely because Jesus actually never called his disciples Christians. He called them disciples, followers. So Acts 17, verse 11, we read of a group of Jews who's heard the Apostle Paul teaching the word of God, and it says, and they received it with gladness. This is the Bereans. Yet this group of people had a special trait um, seldom practiced in the church today. And that was this. Their standard and authority on truth was contextually rightly dividing the scripture and uh, not their interpretation of it. You've got to understand, these were, the Bereans were Jews, but they were open to what Paul was saying. Whereas in Thessalonica, they weren't. That's what Paul referred to. So um, the problem today, of course, is what's happening is people listen to what the pastor is saying, the teacher, the prophet, the evangelist, the church organization. But they're not checking it with the word of God. And I know this sounds basic to us, but I am going somewhere with it. And um, it's also good for, for those that may be not as far on in the Lord. Blind compliance with authority um, is not only foolish, but it's a sin. It's a sin just to follow the leader. Mm -hmm. That's why the church is in the mess it's in. It's a sin just to listen to what I'm saying and believe it. Don't do that. Don't believe what I'm saying. Do what the Bereans did. Go home. Check it out. You say, oh, one day I will. No, we should always check out what's being said in a message. I think part of it is that most people haven't studied the Bible enough. To know. To know. Well, fortunately, we have internet today, so you can Google, but the thing is, you've got to sift through what comes up. You've got to know what you're reading. Mm -hmm. So um, it's also what's going to cause the multitudes to fall away, this blind compliance, in other words, following the leader. That is the very issue that's going to cause people to fall away in the south. So this is relevant for us because whether you know this or not, at least it's going to contextually put things together so you know how to address this. Um, the Apostle Paul confronted Peter, calling him out. Basically, he's a heretic in one of the statements he made. That's pretty hard. Peter walked with Jesus. He's one of the chosen 12. And yet Paul comes along and says, hey, you've got something wrong. We're going to sort this out. <laughs> Paul
Paul wasn't afraid to confront wrong doctrine. And Peter was definitely there. <laughs> so, um, you know, wrong doctrine, money and sex are the enemy's major weapons in the church. And when I say money and sex, I'm talking about the teaching of money and the lack of addressing sexual sin in the church and wrong doctrine. They're the three main weapons Satan's got in the church today. And that's what he uses to build his kingdom. His kingdom. Which is nothing to do with God's kingdom because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So, wrongly dividing scripture. Wrongly interpreting scripture. Church governance, money, worship have all been corrupted because of one reason, not having a true and correct understanding and fear of the Lord, as he said, right? And uh, the challenge to each one here today is, and those who listen, is are we willing to do what the Bereans did? Because what I'm going to give you today is not that simple. It's a hard message. Are we willing to take it and get serious with this and take it before the Lord? Or are we just going to, I don't like that message, I don't agree to it, or, oh yeah, that's fine. Each one of us, doesn't matter our age, need to take what's being taught. Because each one of us are accountable for what we do and we don't do with God's word. So, you know, it concerns me greatly to continue hearing of those in church leadership that do not, they don't uphold God's word as final authority. And it equally concerns me that people would trust the word of any man or any woman, including my wife. <laughs> and that's not a put down. She should never distrust me because I say it. Mm. We have a responsibility, amen, to the to word of God and to God. Amen. So this the, the mindset, how does this happen that we just go along like blind fools? And that's what Jesus called the Pharisees, the religious leaders. How, do, how is it we fall into that trap? I believe it's this. When we're born, we follow our parents. So we should. We listen to what our parents tell us. And we look up to them and think, oh, they must know what they're talking about. So we do it. And then we go to school and the same thing is applied in the education system. They must know what they're talking about, one and one mate too, so I better believe that. And then we go to university and the same thing applies and we get programmed and we get programmed and we get programmed. And we have nothing to check that, no check and balance. And that's why we end up messed up in life. I think that's called tradition. Yeah. Right? Even our parents. So... That's where the mindset comes from. And uh, this laziness of just believing, just accepting the word that's presented, is the reason that whole congregations are going to go to hell, including their pastor. That's a hard statement, but I'll prove it to you today. And Jesus said, these people praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The leaven of the Pharisees was saying one thing and doing another. That's what the leaven of the Pharisees was. Jesus said a little leaven messes the whole lot up. Leavens the whole lot. Which brings me, that was not my message. It's an introduction to where we're going. It brings me to today's message, which is this. It comes from the greatest sermon. Well, actually, the sermon's not correct. In the Greek, it doesn't use that word. The greatest teaching Jesus ever gave, which is the Sermon on the Mount that it's called. And it's actually not correctly said. It is the teaching on the Mount is the correct wording for that. It's the greatest message he ever presented. We haven't got time to go into the whole thing. I want to zero in on the critical part of that sermon, which is in chapter 7. But chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7... Uh, it is the sermon, and um, 
I'll read it because I think I've got it here. What I want to do is go to chapter 7 and just focus in on the critical part of the sermon. Chapter 7 and verse 13. Maybe the most important words Jesus ever gave. In Matthew, right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few that find it. Hold on to that word, few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear fruit good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. Now he brings it to a climax right here. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, you're going to see why I brought this today, so please don't sweep this under the carpet. This probably is the most tragic text in the whole Bible. It's also the most scary to everyone who departs from this world. And a crucial issue in the interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount or the Teaching on the Mount is we understand who the target audience is. That's critical to interpreting this correctly. Was he addressing, addressing true followers or is he addressing a general crowd that's followed him up from Galilee where he's been doing miracles? In chapter 3, 4. And this becomes critical, especially because when you get to this chapter that we're looking at today, um, you can see why. Because many leave this world and stand before him and say, expecting to enter into heaven. Fully expecting it. Where he talks about Lord, Lord, he, he's not saying Lord once, he's saying it twice to get our attention. It's two witnesses there. He's really wanting to get the attention of the reader here. Lord, Lord, but we did cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. I'm going to break that down and interpret that, what that actually means. So, in chapter 5, going back there, he, he says things like, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. So his target audience is not to unbelievers. Because there is no way that you can get to heaven because you're poor in spirit. Or because you're meek. Or because you thirst after him. There is only one way to get to heaven, and that's through him. We know that. Romans 10, 9 and 10. So his target audience here really is his disciples, his followers. Yeah, there's a crowd there, but that's not who he's addressing here. What they need is salvation. He's not talking, he's not talking about making him Lord. He's talking about those who believe that they're saved. Believe they've got eternal life. And he talks about the two roads to getting there. So they're not deceived. The whole Sermon on the Mount is committed to defining true religion. That's what it's all about. What is true religion? What is false religion? And true religion being solely a work of Christ, given as a gift received by faith. We know that. 
You cannot earn it. It cannot be earned. False religion being everything else that requires man's efforts to obtain it. Of course, there's a lot of Jews in this audience. We know that. They believe that the way that they will get to heaven is through their good works, through practicing the law. But his sole audience is not only Jew. There is a mixture here of people. So the law cannot achieve this. Given only as a tutor, we know that to prove that all works were vanity. Only by throwing themselves on the mercy of Christ, on the mercy of God, on the mercy of a loving Saviour, would free the Jews from this endless cycle of effort to redeem themselves. That's the message he's trying to get across here. So what he's trying to get across is your efforts amount to nothing. It's not going to cut it. He's straightening that issue out first. In chapter 5, Jesus redefines the understanding of the Jews of how to get into the kingdom of heaven. He redefines it for them. What they believed before, he's now redefining. This is how you get into heaven. And the blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the first thing he says, chapter 5. That would be like getting hit in the face for a Jew. And uh, he's defining a new standard to enter into the kingdom. You must become as a beggar. <laughs> and someone who's void of anything to offer God. We have to come to that place. There's nothing I can do or give him to get me into heaven. One who's desperate and knows it. This is what he's saying. Blessed are him who's poor in spirit. You know how desperate you are. You can't do anything other than receive his grace and his mercy. And that desperation must be the first understanding of any seeker if it's a true conversion. That's why I said what I said at the beginning. I question now whether my conversion was true 40 years ago. Because I wasn't desperate for my did it as a path of course in a church. Raise your hands if you want to accept Christ. And then I went off and continued sinning. That's not true salvation. That's the issue Jesus is dealing with here. It's not a desperation due to the fear of going to hell. Which is why I received Christ 40 years ago. I was afraid of going to hell. And I thought I had received him. It's not a desperation so I can make it to heaven. It's a desperation because I recognize there's no purpose to me living without him. And the Jews would have been shocked, absolutely horrified with these words because they believe they're spiritually rich. What do you mean we're blessed if we're poor in spirit? We've been given the law. How dare you say that? God himself has given Moses the law. And he's redefining their whole paradigm here. He's letting them know you're bankrupt. Zero. You've got nothing in your account. Spiritually, you're dead. And you've got nothing to offer God. And if you want righteousness, then you must hunger and thirst after it. <laughs> righteousness being right standing with God and blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake I thought about that this morning as I was just wrapping this message up I thought he's not asking us to tolerate persecution he's saying you're blessed so we should be happy when we're persecuted <laughs> We should be praising God when we're persecuted. I don't know if you get persecuted. I do at least once or twice a week, maybe more. And we should be happy we're receiving persecution for his name's sake, for righteousness' name. But then he tells them, if your righteousness is not more than the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter into heaven. <laughs> he makes an impossible task for them. Paraphrase, it's impossible for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't do it through good works. You can't. No matter how hard you try, sin is going to stop you. It's going to prevent you. So faith in a saviour is the only way. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 verse 3, speaking of the Jews, said, because they were ignorant of God's righteousness, 
they went about to establish their own. Now we can't just throw mud at the Jews this morning. Because look at the Christian church as well. Trying to establish their own righteousness by good works, by good deeds. And Jesus pulls together two realities, and I want to just hone in on these, divine achievement and human achievement. This is the contrast he's bringing out here. And there is a stark difference, two gates. A wide gate, a narrow gate. Stark difference. Two roads, a broad and a narrow road. Two destinies, life and destruction. Two crowds, there are many and there are few, he says. Two trees, or two lots of fruit, good and corrupt. Two behaviours, those who say and those who do. And two builders, a wise builder and a foolish builder. Two foundations, rock and sand. Two houses, one that stands, one that falls. This is what he's showing them. This, this literally reduces the spiritual world down to two options. One being the path to heaven, the other the path to hell. That's what this defines it down to. And the road to hell is always marked heaven because nobody wants to put this road goes to hell. <laughs> it doesn't sell good tapes. <laughs> It doesn't sell good messages. People don't want to sit in a church to be told, you're going to hell. So every road leads to heaven, the wide road and the narrow road. The problem is when you get to the end of the road, you find out the truth. Only one leads to heaven. <laughs> Nobody sells tickets to hell. They only offer tickets to heaven. So we need to break down these options Jesus has given, making it as simple as possible today, I'll try and do that, and just focus on one of these things, and that's the narrow gate. And uh, Jesus is the narrow gate, and only through him one can enter. We know that, and this gate must be entered alone, not in a group ses ses session, not as a family, not as a church. It has to be individually, and in the 10th chapter of Matthew, verse 34, our Lord says, Do not think that I come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to set a man against his brother and a mother against his daughter and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Some of us can say amen to that. We know that already. Hmm? Isn't that truth? Then Luke 14 Verse 25, Jesus reveals the cost of entering through this narrow gate. This is the cost. He who loves his father more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his life more than me is not worthy of me. He who doesn't take up his cross is not worthy of me. He who has found his life must lose it. And we know all this, we've heard it all before. But I hope that the Holy Spirit will bring something today to you. See, it may mean that we have to break from everything and everyone who is part of our life in order to follow Christ. It may not, but it may mean that. Are we willing to do that if necessary? We could easily add, he who loves his wife or husband more than me, is not worthy of me. And I added this in because it's an issue that is very, very pertinent in the church today when marriage is put before Christ. And I'm going to expand on what I mean by that. <clears throat> the subject of correct governance in the home is hotly debated. This is one of the topics that someone called me on this week. It's very much debated in today's modern church with liberalism, liberalism that entered back in the Garden of Eden, chapter 3. We know that. When Eve sinned against God and against her husband. I believe that the subject of correct governance in a marriage 
is the reason why marriages break down. I really do. Only under correct governance have you with the protection of God in a marriage. Eve usurped her authority in the Garden of Eden over her husband. How? Not by what she did to her husband, by what she did to God. The issue isn't really about your husband or wife. The issue is about God. Ephesians 5.22, something we all know, and you think I'm going off subject. I'm not. Why submit? Hupatasso, the word. Yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. In other words, the reason you do this is because you are submitted to the Lord. The reason we submit wives to our husbands or men, husbands, to the Lord, is because we're doing it for his sake. Not for my wife's sake. Not for my husband. Oh, I'll submit to you because you're my husband. No, that's the wrong, wrong foundation straight away. That's not going to work. The reason a wife submits to her husband is because she is submitted unto the Lord. Her primary reason for submitting is to honour God. So she has the protection of God in that marriage. And the husband doesn't get off here. This is not chauvinistic, because the husband has to submit unto the Lord in order to be able to love his wife correctly. <laughs> so this is mutual. But there is a correct governance, not only in the home, but in the church which most churches would hate me saying today, there is a correct governance in the church that God has established. And sadly, because of Eve's sin in chapter 3 of Genesis, the church has totally ignored it. Usually because men have sinned. And when a man sins in a marriage or within the church, who's in authority, God has given authority to, whether it be in the home or in the church, he loses his position of authority and by proxy, the woman take it on. That's what happens. So for the husbands is the head of the wife, verse 24, as Christ is the head of the church, as Ephesians 5 we're in. Just as Christ is subject, sorry, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In other words, the husband has to die to himself in order to love his wife. The woman's submission is not because the man is superior. That's malchauvinism. Nor does he deserve it. That's the truth. But she does it because it pleases the Lord. That's why she does it. And unity requires relational structure. Yet submission is never a sign of value. It doesn't mean that you're more important than your wife. You're not. Jesus submitted to his father. It would be heresy to say he was any less value than the Father. Not my will, but yours be done. There has to be correct governance. Which got me thinking about why we've got such a major falling away in the end times. Because the structure of the home and the church is all out of order. And it no longer has the protection, or the better word is the authority of God, to protect it. There is no longer a safety net over the church because the structure God set in place has been removed. And Satan can come in and deceive even the very elect at work. This is why. So um, Jesus submitted to his father. As I say, a marriage that is not founded on God's word falls outside of this structure. You cannot apply this, these scriptures to a marriage that's not founded on 
the biblical marriage. What do I mean by that? We know that that chastity before all that. These scriptures don't apply to a marriage that's not founded on truth. So the marriage has to come back to that place of truth. If it, if it was founded wrong, there has to be repentance, separation from the sin, and then founded on truth. So to try and bring these scriptures into a marriage that's been founded in infidelity is an absolute waste of time, unless repentance has taken place. I'm saying this for a reason that many husbands and wives have abused God's structure and by doing so, love their partner more than they do the Lord. This is a very, very big issue. Firstly, the, the wife, the husband and wife, must be both submitted to the Lord in order for the marriage to function correctly. If the wife is submitted to the Lord and the husband is not, abuse will enter. Let's say you have a lady in our meeting here and her husband is abusing her, for example. Then the husband has stepped outside of his authority in the marriage. If she tolerates that abuse, she is loving her husband more than she loves truth. That's not twisting scripture. The only way these scriptures will work is in the correct governance that God has set up. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Not husbands, beat your wives and wives accept that. Or husbands, run off and have affairs and your wife accept it. No, 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 no. And when she does accept it, well, I just have to hang in there, I just have to put up with this and because I'm afraid, or whatever the reason is, she has stepped outside of the scripture that she is putting her husband before Christ. Why? Because she's enabling his sin. And I know that's a heavy subject. Most don't want to hear it in the church. But it's the reason most marriages are in such a mess. We have husbands expecting their wives to submit to them using the Bible to demand submission when they've already severed the covenant through infidelity. That's nonsense. That's not God's plan at all. Forcing Christ outside of the relationship, that's sin. And then that woman is subjected to his sin. She no longer has the protection of the covenant. And she suffers. Whether it's Infidelity, whether it's emotional or physical abuse, makes no difference. It's all the same. That means if I tolerate that, I am loving that person more than I'm loving Christ. Because Christ and his word are one. You can't separate the two. Loving your husband or wife more than Christ can also be abuse, as I've said. Tolerated at home. Abuse is a perverted understanding of love. That's what it is. A perverted understanding of love. There is no acceptable reason for tolerating it. I know that here, this is not an issue. Well, I think it's not, to my understanding. But it doesn't mean to say some will listen to this, it's not. It is a major, major problem in the church. There is no acceptable reason for tolerating it. No acceptable reason to abuse. And allowing abuse only enables the person to continue harming themselves and sending themselves to hell. We're talking about a true disciple today. It also continues and enables that person to harm everyone affected, their wife, the children. I know. Some of you know, because you may have grown up in this. I know what this is like. And the children carry on the next generation of abusers. The narrow gate. He who loves anyone more than me is not worthy of me. 
That's my point for saying all of that. The narrow gate is not easy, despite what most of us were taught in church, that you just put your hand up and receive Christ. Luke 13, verse 24, Jesus answered a question that is asked of him in verse 23. And this is what they asked him, will only a few be saved? I don't know if you've ever read that before. That's an astounding question. Will only a few be saved? They asked Jesus that. Of which he replies in verse 24. This is Luke 13, 24. Strive. That word strive in the Greek means to agonize. Agonize. To enter through the gate. For many will seek to enter the narrow gate. But will not be able. That's astounding. I don't know if you've ever read that. Many will, many will try to enter through the narrow gate, but they will not be able. Wow. The kingdom of heaven, heaven suffers violence. I'll put this in its correct context of scripture, and the violent take it by force. Becoming a Christian is a war. A war against yourself. That is the correct context of that scripture. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So becoming a Christian, a follower of Christ, means there's a war going on. That war is against yourself. Are you willing to lose your family? Here's the war. Your friends, are you willing to deny your personal ambition, your goals, your wants? Are you willing to turn away from sin? Are you willing to lose the sovereignty that everyone has who's born into this world to make choices of your own? Everyone has that sovereignty. It's called free will. Are you willing to lose that to make Jesus Lord? Isaiah said, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous in his thoughts, which means you must go against even the way that you think. <laughs> That's kind of difficult. We must actually fight against even the way we think. It would be nice if, you know, in an altar call, the pastor would say, are you willing to lose your sovereignty? Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah. <coughs> are you willing to give up your free will? Yeah. That's the salvation message. This is this is the ticket. This is the ticket. You gotta give up your free will. <laughs> <laughs> huh? The narrow gate's not easy. It can only be entered by a true repentant person who hates what he's become. That's how we know if we're truly saved. Do I hate what I've become? Am I truly disgusted in myself so much that I cry out? For mercy, am I truly repentant if what I've done, what I've become, when I look at myself, am I, do I want to vomit, basically? That's true salvation. That's what salvation is. That's what repentance is. Turning, isn't it, Val? Turning from the past. When Christ becomes so valuable that you're stripped bare, that's when you're ready for the narrow gate. Mary Magdalene is a classic case of this. Naked. Stripped of everything. No dignity left. That's someone who's ready for the narrow gate. When you're willing to make Christ Lord, Lord of my thinking, Lord of my decision making, then I'm ready. That's when I'm ready for salvation. Not before. And that's why we've got so many problems in the church. Because like the rich man that comes to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, give up everything you got. doesn't mean that every person should do that. The problem is the things had the guy. And Jesus nails the problem straight away. Well, you need to give up what you've got and follow me. And for each of us, it's different what we have to give up. But we've got to be willing to give up anything that's got me. Whatever it is. Everything has to go. And the Bible says he went away feeling sad. 
because he wasn't willing to do that. The love of money was holding him from following Christ. Is there a love in my life that is Lord? I asked myself that question yesterday. I'm still pondering it. Is there a love in my life that is Lord? Anything. Habits. People. Materialism. Education. My father, my mother. My will, my desire. The Bible said the man went away sad because he would not give up what stood between him and following the Lord. And we try and balance the books by doing good works then. We go, we'll do this for you, Lord. We go we become a missionary or we give a $1,000 to the church fund or we go to every prayer meeting or we go to every whatever meeting and we try and balance the books because we don't want to give up our life, but we'll give a little bit of something in return. That's the people that are not saved. That's the people that are going to fall away in the great apostasy, which is most, because he said, wide is that road, and narrow is this road, and only a few are on it. So we're talking the majority are not on the right road at the moment. Proverbs 30 verse 12, there are those who are pure in their own eyes, yet not washed from their filth. <laughs> that was the problems of the Jews. I'm not hammering the Jews because the problem of most of the church today too. There are those that are pure in their own eyes, yet they are not washed from their filth. In other words, they've got a foot in each camp. They're beating their wives up. They're watching pornography. They're going off and, and sleeping with prostitutes. They're whatever they're doing, they're sinning. They want a foot in each camp. They're not willing to give up that sinful life and make Jesus Lord. But in their own eyes, they think they're pure. Romans 12, 10 verse 2, speaking of the Jewish people, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. <laughs> it's tragic to think that a non-believer in Christ goes to hell. It's even more tragic to think that one who believes they are saved would go to hell. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine yourself? You lead this world and you stand before him. Fully expecting from the say, enter in. And you hear these words, I don't know you. But Lord, Lord, I, I set up an orphanage. I preached crusades and thousands come to you. I delivered many. I healed the sick in your name. All of that's true in my life and more. He said, I don't know you. How can it be? It used, they used to baffle me. I think, surely not, God, I've done all this. I know I've got a few bad things over here, but I've done all this, and yeah, I'm still sinning over here, but, you know, let's balance the scales out a bit here. Mm. It sounds funny, but it's not funny. It's sad because that's how most believers, when I say believers in small b, I'm not talking about true followers of Christ. Most Christians believe that that is acceptable. And this is known as the Judas tragedy. One who hangs around Jesus enough. One who's seen the miracles, the healings, the deliverance. But he ends up belonging to Satan. That's Judas. That's what theologians call it, the Judas tragedy. One who goes to church, one who hears the gospel, one who believes they're saved, one who preaches at other people. Consider Judas for a moment. One of the twelve, he travels with Jesus, he saw miracles. He no doubt did miracles, because he was empowered to do miracles by Christ himself. He no doubt cast demons out. Have you ever wondered how this passage in Matthew 7 plays out? But Lord, I did this in your name. Judas did this in his name. Cast out demons, healed the sick, did miracles, signs and wonders. Yet Jesus calls him the son of perdition. That word perdition means utter destruction. Son of hell. 
What's the major deception in the story here? But Lord, he calls him Lord, which means master, ruler, leader of my life. Right there, he's a liar. Right there, this person who stands before God, and says, but Lord, I did the... He's lying right from the word go when he calls him Lord because he was never his Lord. Listen to the language of the Lord in Luke 14, verse 25. Now large crowds were following him and he said, if anyone doesn't hate his own life, he cannot follow me. Hate his own life. Which one of you firstly does not count the cost before he builds? That's the scripture every salvation needs before a person can come to Christ. They must be told that. For people that we're going to come across in the future, this is, this is a primary scripture for salvation. Everyone that does not hate his own life cannot follow me. Which one of you firstly does not count the cost. And yet we say, just put your hand up and receive Christ, or say these words, or quote Romans 10, 9, that's other nonsense. That is a deception that the church has been led down the wrong path with. He who does not count the cost before he builds. And then he goes on, he said, none of you can be my disciples who doesn't give up everything. Wow. That kind of means that if we're still trying to control things, we better give it up real quick. <laughs> Let's not think he's talking about anyone else except me today. Whatever I'm trying to control, we better give it up real quick. What he's saying is, don't follow me if you have not counted the cost. And isn't the, this is the very opposite of what most people have been taught. This is sad. When I was studying, it brought tears to my eyes. Because no one did that to me. And I wish they had of. I wish they had of told me the truth. I did miracles in your name. I cast out demons in your name. And see, the danger for us is believing these people Jesus says he doesn't know at some time knew him. They never knew him. He never knew them, ever. That's what he says. I never knew you. Never is a strong word. Never means there is no time in what you believe you were walking as a Christian that I know you. That's scary. You can go to church, do all this stuff, believing you are saved. And he doesn't know you. And the reason some have interpreted it that way is they say, how could an unbeliever do miracles? How could an unbeliever cast out demons then? Because isn't it only believers have that authority? No. No. That's another deception in the church. And it's going to be one of the end time deceptions and the apostasy. Look at Judas. There's an answer to it right there. He did miracles. He cast out demons. And yet he's the son of hell, Jesus said. And the devil can, and he does do miracles through people. The devil. Actually, it will be one, if not the main reason, of the great falling away. Read it. Jesus said he never knew them. In no time did he know them. He's not saying he didn't know of them. He's not saying, I didn't know anything about you, Martin. He, I knew everything about you. But he's not using that word in that sense. He's using the word gnosko, which is a personal relationship, an intimate relationship like a husband and a wife. There is no intimacy ever between us. So contrast the narrow to the wide gate in verse 13. The gate is wide, the way is broad. 
And you can come with the whole crowd and I'll wrap this up in a minute with all your baggage through the wide gate on the wide road. You can bring whatever you want. You don't have to deny yourself on that road. You can come with all your sin. You can come with no repentance. We used to sing a song, Just As I Am. That's a lie. That's a lie because in a sense it's true, but mostly it's a lie. Why? You can't, you can't carry on in your sin. Just as, oh, come to your Lord with my sin. No, you can't do that. We've got to be willing to lay down our life right there at the beginning of our commitment with Christ. You can come with no repentance. And all you become is religious. And that's why he's hammering these people on the Sermon of the Mount. This road you can live as you want, the wide road. Because God is love and he loves me so much, regardless of what I do. I've heard that dribble, pass the bucket around and vomit. That's horrible. So there are two gates. The rest of the comparisons that I'm going to address next week, God willing, is we're out of time. But before I end, let's consider this. Jesus is not speaking to non-religious people. He's speaking to religious people. He's speaking to the most religious people of the day, the church of that hour. All of them were church-going people. All of them were following him because they, they liked what he said. All of their life was shaped and fashioned by God's laws as far as the Jews went in this crowd. They have a form of godliness without the reality of it. They are self-deceived. Surely the most tragic word here that Jesus uses is many. Many will say, but Lord, if you just stop and ponder that and put yourself in that place, but Lord, I, I, I did this, I did that. It's not hard to tie the words back there to verse 13, which he says, many are those who enter through the broad way. through the wide gate. And what's terribly concerning is the wide gate and the broad road have the same sign. <laughs> Heaven. And that's the deception. How do you get to this place where you are so comfortable in your own deception? What draws you, me, into this blinding foolishness that we believe we're saved when we're not. I'm not speaking it directly to you. It's a question. And Christendom is dominated with a shallow understanding of salvation. And what I mean by that is a failure to understand the true terms of the gospel. That, that, there, there lays the problem. All of us have been in large churches. All of us have seen what, what we're talking about today. How do you get to that place where you become so blind, so deceived, that when we stand before him, we say, Lord, Lord, we're taken totally in shock. I believe it's because of the shallowness of the presentation of the gospel. And there is going to be a great harvest coming in this hour. Let us not be one who presents this gospel lightly. Matter of fact, it needs to be made difficult for people <coughs> to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's better people know the truth and walk away than accept a lie and enter into the white gate. Father, I thank you for this message. I hope that it's important to my family here as much as it is to me. <coughs> Lord, if there's something in our own life that needs changing, to get onto this narrow road, to go through this narrow gate, Lord, I pray that you will assist us this day. 
to get onto the right road. Lord, for those that are struggling out there in their marriages, fighting, abuse, broken covenants, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their marriage. We pray for restoration. Do what you need to do, Lord, in that marriage so that neither party are putting themselves before you. Lord, because when you are at the head of the home, there is protection. There is love. There is blessing. Lord, outside of that, it's out of destruction. Father, let the words of your scripture today ring strong in our ears this week that we may not take this message lightly, Lord, and say, oh, we're saved, we're okay. But let us examine ourselves in the light of these scriptures, Lord, and be honest with ourselves. Have I died to myself? Have I given up everything to follow you? Is there anything that could pull me back onto that wide road? Lord, prompt our spirit, prick our hearts today, I pray in Jesus' name. For those that weren't here, Lord, can't be here for whatever reason, I pray you speak to them. Lord, that this message would not be in vain, that you would prompt the hearts of our brethren, we ask in Jesus' name.